Hi guys, it's me Quinn, and as always, if you appreciate my content, consider hitting the like button. It's the only way the YouTube algorithm really notices me. Imagine you are living a mediocre life. You're trying, but you're really just going through the motions. You're an earnest person, though you struggle to make genuine connections, so you really don't have any friends. And though you love your parents, they really don't see or appreciate you. You work a meaningless job that you hate with a boss that hates you. You once had big dreams and even though you still are a bit naive and foolish in the way that young people often are, you begin to see that your dreams might not actually be achievable. This is the world you live in. Your only real comforts are video games and your little dog Seymour. And then one day, suddenly, in an instant, you wake up and all of that is gone, and you are brought into a strange and unfamiliar world. This is the story of the character Philip J. Fry from the cartoon sci-fi show Futurama. In this video, I will explain why Futurama is my favorite cartoon of all time, why I think it has some of the greatest sci-fi protagonists ever, and why I think every fan of science fiction should give this show a try. Keep in mind this video will have some spoilers. I can't actually talk about what makes the show great without giving some actual details about what happens. So if hearing spoilers is something that makes you lose interest in watching something, then probably don't watch this. Futurama begins when Philip J. Fry, after being accidentally frozen, awakes in the year 3000. 1000 years in the future in the city of New New York. The city was built on top of the original New York which had been destroyed by alien invaders. The original New York which was accessible still through the sewers was inhabited by an entire society of mutants presumably deformed by waste dumped into the sewers by people who lived on the surface. By the year 3000, Earth has a whole one-world government, and space travel at incredible speeds is possible. Because of faster-than-light space travel, humankind has made contact with countless alien species, many of which inhabit the Earth and integrate into society without a problem. Oftentimes, aliens in Futurama are used to represent certain groups of people in the real world. This concept is also found in shows like Star Trek, which Futurama constantly references, though we'll get to that. Earth is also inhabited by millions of sentient robots who have lives and jobs of their own. Robots in the series are also sometimes used to represent the working class, though individual robots do inhabit a number of different roles in society, from actors to sex workers to gangsters to psychiatrists. Plenty of humans have also elected to live off-world, Mars is habitable, and there are some that even live on the moon. There are also countless other humans that live and or work on planetary colonies or space stations. So we've already been introduced to our main protagonist, Philip J. Fry, now let's move on to our other characters. There's Leela, who at the beginning of the series knows nothing about her true homeworld, or of her parents. Leela is a character that desperately wants to integrate into society but has difficulty due to her insecurities relating to her appearance. She is mostly human looking except for the fact that she has one large eye. She's the only one of her species on the planet Earth due to the fact that she was abandoned on the world as a baby. Leela and Fry have in common that they are both deeply alone. Bender is also one of the show's main characters. He's a sentient, alcoholic, amoralistic robot. Bender and Fry basically have a best friend buddy relationship throughout the series. Then you have Professor Farnsworth. He is Fry's last living relative in the year 3000, his nephew in fact. The professor is a kooky scientist who also owns an intergalactic shipping company called Planet Express. Other side characters include Zoidberg, an alien lobster who's also an incompetent medical doctor, Amy Wong, a rich intern from the planet Mars, and Hermes, a, a bureaucrat who is also co-owner of Planet Express. Each of these characters receives central episodes at some point in the series, and these episodes work to develop the characters' backstories and help us get to know them more. So essentially the gist of the show is, the crew of the Planet Express ship, Captain Leela, Fry, and Bender are tasked with delivering packages to all sorts of strange places throughout the universe. Futurama depicts the voyages of the Planet Express ship as they explore the final frontier. They encounter all sorts of strange new worlds and new civilizations. As a kid, Futurama was the show that ignited my love for science fiction, and even though the show is technically a comedy, it is also in my opinion one of the best sci-fi shows ever made. Not only is the show usually successful at being a comedy, it manages to portray interesting, deep, and thematically complex narratives that quite simply gut you when you least expect it. And here are some examples. 
The Luck of the Fryish is a major character episode for Philip J. Fry. His relationship with his family becomes much clearer and much more defined. In this episode, Fry, after experiencing a string of bad luck, remembers his seven-leaved clover, which he hid away before he was accidentally frozen and woken up in the year 3000. He journeys underground to his old home, in the original New York, to find it, but upon searching finds out that it had been stolen. Throughout the episode, we are shown flashbacks of Fry's interactions with his family, specifically his older brother Yancey, who from Fry's perspective seemed covetous of everything in his life, the seven-leaved clover, his ability to play basketball, his ability to dance, even his name, Philip J. Fry. After discovering a statue resembling his brother Yancey among the ruins of old New York, displaying the clover and etched with Fry's name rather than Yancey's, Fry comes to the conclusion that his older brother had stolen the clover and not only had used it to become successful in life, but had stolen his name as well. The man depicted in the statue had also accomplished Fry's lifelong dream of becoming the first man on Mars. To Fry, his brother has stolen the life that he should have lived. The episode goes to a dark place and Fry ends up digging up the grave of who he considers to be the false Philip J. Fry. After recovering the clover, Fry makes the discovery, however. Written on the gravestone reads, Here lies Philip J. Fry, named for his uncle to carry on his spirit. It hadn't been Fry's brother after all. Fry had always considered his brother imitating him as stealing, when it was actually admiration. Though Fry had journeyed to the year 3000, to everyone else he had simply gone missing. Fry's brother Yancey had named his first son after the brother he admired who vanished mysteriously one day, and gave him the clover he found amongst Fry's things not because he believed it was magically lucky, but because he knew it was an item that his brother deeply cared for. Upon the realization of this, Fry sheds a tear. He leaves the clover where he found it. The point of this is not whether or not the clover was actually somehow lucky. The point is that Fry assumed that his brother Yancey had hated him and was probably glad that he had gone missing. But from Yancey's perspective, he lost the person he had admired the most in his life. Son. I'm naming you Philip J. Fry in honor of my little brother, who I miss every day. I love you, Philip, and I always will. By naming his first son after his brother and giving him the clover, Yancey is attempting to keep a part of Fry alive. He will always see a part of his brother within his son, and because he did in fact love and admire his brother so much, he probably encouraged the good characteristics within his son that resembled his brother's good characteristics. Yancey even kept Philip's drawing from when he was a kid depicting him on a rocket ship, and it's hung over his son's crib. The episode is basically implying that this is probably what inspired Yancey's son to become an astronaut in the first place, and to be the first man on Mars. Truly carrying on Fry's spirit. The episode is about how the perspectives we have as children don't always fully align with reality, and if we could learn to see things from others' perspectives, we could spare ourselves a lot of pain and anger. Another episode that I really love is the episode Godfellas. After being shot into outer space due to an accident, Bender finds himself adrift in deep space, with the crew of the Planet Express ship never able to catch up with him. After moving through an asteroid field, a rock inhabited by tiny humanoid creatures lands on him. The citizens assume that he is God. Now, loads of serious works of science fiction have dealt with this idea, but the way in which Futurama deals with it has to be applauded, if anything, for its straightforwardness in delivering these ideas. Essentially, it is the question of whether or not God deserves worship. Bender, of course, is a character who only really cares about himself. He doesn't really put anyone before himself. Initially, Bender demands that the small people bring him booze, which leads to countless of them injured or dead. Bender feels guilty about this and attempts to help the tiny people by performing miracles, but mostly they don't go correctly either and end up causing even more damage. Eventually, Bender decides that the best thing he could do would be not to interfere, but by that point it's too late. Bender's religion has led to a war between the believers and the non-believers amongst the tiny people, and that ends up annihilating all of them. The men, the women, 
and the children. Look, Daddy, I'm hugging God. Mm, mm. Maybe if I hug him real hard, he'll save us from... Like much in Futurama, the entire narrative is played comically while dealing with a very dark subject matter. I should point out that both The Simpsons and South Park did similar episodes, but neither of those really handle the themes in the same way as Futurama, especially considering what happens in the second half of the episode. After the destruction of the tiny people civilization, Bender is alone floating in the void. While drifting, he notices that a nearby galaxy is signaling out in binary code. He calls out and suddenly speaks to him. The entity claims that it has always been, that it has love for all things. Bender asks if that being is God, but it doesn't really give a clear answer, and it doesn't know the direction of Earth. Bender and the being begin to discuss the events that occurred with the tiny people because apparently this being had been watching. Bender remarks that he had tried to help them, but he had had difficulty determining what was right and what was wrong, to which the being responds, Right and wrong are just words. What matters is what you do. I think the episode is basically saying that sometimes no single moral framework can be applied to everything. Sometimes it is not so easy to determine the best action. And this is why a man, or in Bender's case a robot, should never play God. One person cannot determine what is right and what is wrong for an entire society of people. There's just too much nuance. Attempting to play God will only damage the society more. And this is also, as Bender learns at the end of the episode, why one should never put faith in any so-called God to do anything for you, which turned out to be the lesson that the entity had for him. It is never stated whether or not the being Bender encounters is actually God, probably not just some extremely powerful ancient being, but it does seem to be a benevolent entity at the very least. All in all, this is definitely one of the most memorable episodes of Futurama, and one that has stuck with me throughout these years. So now we have to discuss what many people consider to be the saddest episode of Futurama, Jurassic Bark. As I mentioned earlier, Fry's only comforts back in the year 1999 were video games and his dog Seymour. But when Fry vanished, Seymour was left behind in the early 20th century in New York. In this episode, we learn what happened to Seymour. After discovering Seymour's mummified body in a museum, Fry convinces them to return Seymour's mummy to him. The professor informs Fry that if he wishes, they can make a clone of Seymour from the DNA in the fossil. But at the last moment, Fry stops the process. He realizes that Seymour had lived an additional 12 years after he had vanished. Perhaps it wasn't right to bring him back now, no matter how much he had missed him. I'll never forget him, but he forgot me a long, long time ago. However, in flashbacks throughout the episode, it is implied that Fry is wrong. Seymour is seen distressed, searching the city for Fry, and he's even able to find him. Seymour leads Fry's parents to his cryonically frozen body, but even with their missing son's body right in front of them, they still don't see him, this time in the literal sense. Seymour tried his best. He did everything a dog could do, but still in the end, he could not save his best friend. Seymour was forced to leave knowing the whole time exactly where Fry was and not understanding why he could never come home. At the end of the episode, a time lapse of Seymour waiting for Fry is shown as the dog grows older and older throughout the seasons and eventually lays down to die. This is without a doubt the saddest ending to a cartoon episode ever, and as a kid watching it I definitely shed a tear, and still would. This episode is about the things we leave behind as we grow and change. It's about the assumptions that we make to justify it. Oh, I'm sure my middle school best friend that I never attempted to contact after we changed schools is doing fine. I bet they have a great life. Maybe they don't. Maybe they missed you. Maybe the absence of you in their life negatively impacted them. There is a bright side, however. When Futurama came back on the air after being canceled for a few years, 
it is retcon that a version of Fry did go back to the past and live as Seymour's companion. So Seymour wasn't alone after all. I know some people don't really like this and I totally understand why because it fundamentally changes the ending of the original Seymour episode. However, if you use the multiple universes view of time travel, then that would mean that Fry's original Seymour actually did die alone and the other version of him got to spend a life with Fry. If that makes you any happier, I guess. The episode named A Clone of My Own is an episode all about death. In a society where medical science has reached a level where people can live indefinitely, what happens to the extremely old when society is done with them? Turns out in the world of Futurama, when you turn 160, robots known as the Sunset Squad take you away to a mysterious planet and you're never seen again. So essentially, everyone on Earth knows when they are gonna die. They know exactly how much time they have to live, barring any freak accident. In the episode, an aging Professor Farnsworth growing weary at what he considers to be his failures and lack of accomplishments in his life, decides to create a clone of himself to live on in his name. But upon discovering that the clone doesn't represent who he is, a depressed Farnsworth alerts the Sunset Squad to come and take him away. The episode involves the Planet Express crew going to the near Death Star, where the robots have placed Professor Farnsworth along with endless other former citizens of Earth into a kind of matrix. The information presented in this episode about what happens to the old is one of the many things that exposes the Futurama future as far darker than it often appears on the surface if you just glance. In the year 3000, at a certain age, all citizens are assigned a job. They do not get to choose what job they are assigned. Some undefined system decides what is best for them, eliminating choice entirely. Compliance is necessary. Anyone who refuses to do the job assigned is executed. Political candidates are sometimes literal clones of each other. Advertisements are broadcast in their dreams. There are television stations that literally brainwash you. And the best part of it is, most of the dystopian aspects of Futurama are merely exaggerations of the real world. We, in today's society, often work jobs that we hate just to survive. Political candidates who are supposed to be on opposite sides of issues often don't seem to be that different from their political opponents once they're elected. We too are inundated with advertisements everywhere we look and everywhere we go, and television is often full of brainwashing lies. Futurama, like all good science fiction, not only is extremely entertaining, but is saying something meaningful about our society and about the human experience, and it's warning us about certain problems in our society that might be exacerbated by technology. Futurama is a bright and colorful show, but there's also a deep sadness to it. In the first episode, we are introduced to suicide booths. We can see that there's a line outside of the suicide booth indicating that there's a high desire for suicide in the Futurama society. This is, of course, indicative of the fact that there is a high level of depression in their society. And of course there would be considering all of the things that I just mentioned. They don't get to decide their job, they don't really get to decide who leads them, and soulless corporations are constantly using sneaky and unethical tactics to influence them to buy and consume things they don't need. In case you haven't realized, Futurama is jammed packed with references to science fiction. There's 2001 A Space Odyssey, there's Star Wars, the work of Isaac Asimov, Twilight Zone, The Planet of the Apes, Soylent Green, Dune, and more than any other, Star Trek. The entire main cast of the original Star Trek even showed up for an episode. Futurama is a show made by sci-fi fans for sci-fi fans, and it definitely paved the way for shows like Rick and Morty. If it hadn't been for this show, I would have never become the sci-fi fan that I am. This channel would not exist as it is today. This show, because of its constant retro sci-fi references, was extremely important for me in developing a taste for classic sci-fi and all sci-fi in general. You really grow to love the main cast of the show as well, even Zoidberg, and the voice actors really do a great job with all of these characters. Futurama will always have a place in my heart as my most beloved sci-fi cartoon, and I hope this video helps you understand why. What's your favorite episode of Futurama? Let me know in the comments.